Ata si God. I'm here Ayan. again. Okay. Um, wala. Hello? Anybody tell me what's the last thing that you've heard? <laughs> Okay. So, okay, okay. So, as I was said, these are two competing um, theories on whether the universe was big enough to support another galaxy within it or whether the universe was just as big as the Milky Way. Now, uh, long story short, hello? Long story short, um, Harlow Shapley won the debate because of the sheer amount of evidence that he was able to present. However, it turns out that Shapley wasn't, uh, wasn't right uh, all along. His support from Adrian Van Manen um, actually was found to be, uh, Adrian Van Manen's observation that the galaxy would, was spinning was actually shown to be a, an observational error based on faulty equipment. And actually, Edmund Hubble also disproved the static universe why? Because the stars that he saw in Andromeda were supposedly the brightest stars. Okay, so looking at our, those same stars in our galaxy, um, uh, comparing them showed that those stars in uh, Andromeda were very, very faint. So that means that if there were the same star to, type of stars and they were very faint, those stars must be very, very far away. Now, uh, Edmund Hubble also disproved the static universe. Edmund Hubble found out through different ways, uh, particularly uh, the redshift, that the universe is actually expanding. It is not receding, it is not static. So he was able to prove Einstein's cosmological model. In fact, Einstein admits his truth writings as his greatest wonder. Now, after that, Father uh, Reverend George Lemaitre in 1931, published his theory as what we call the cosmic egg exploding at the moment of creation. Does it sound familiar? That is because it is also the birth of the Big Bang theory. The name Big Bang was just presented to us by astronomer Fred Hoyle back in 1949 as a way to poke fun at the theory of uh, Reverend George. So in other words, this was not an acceptable theory back then, but it is now. So we now go to the standard cosmological model itself. This is really the Big Bang Theory. The standard cosmological model says that the universe started at about 14 billion years ago in an event which we call the Big Bang. The historical data that I gave earlier gives us a glimpse of how the scientific process works by disproving, by, co by corroborating, by debates, and by questioning. Now, Around 4 billion, 14 billion years ago, it is said that the universe started. How do we know that it's 14 billion years? Remember the discussion about Edmund Hubble? Well, because he was able to get what we call a Hubble's, Hubble's constant, so he was able to measure the amount of recession or how fast galaxies were traveling away, depending on how they, far they are to us. In other words, he's saying that the farther a galaxy is away from us, the, the faster it flows away. Okay. So that estimated value of the rate of expansion is now called the Hubble constant or parameter. Now, um, suppose the Hubble, car par the Hubble parameter is 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So that is the amount of distance and that is the amount of speed. In order for us to get the Hubble time or how long it would be, then that we would divide it by one. So it is simply a derivative. So if the Hubble uh, parameter is 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec, that would make 20 billion years. In order for us to get the Hubble time or how long it would be, then that we would divide it by one. So it is simply a derivative. So if the Hubble uh, parameter is 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec, that would make 20 billion years until the edge of the universe. If it is 100, then that would make it 10 billion years. Right now, based on our uh, spacecraft that we, that we sent out to space, the Hubble parameter is at 67.8, plus or minus 0.77. That is measured as of March 2015, yielding a time 
around 13.7 14 billion years ago that means that is the wall of space uh, the wall of light that we encounter at the edge of the universe otherwise what we call as the cosmic background radiation why because Several million years ago, 14 billion years ago, supposedly the primordial atom exploded. And because it exploded, there was a vast amount of energy that is scattered through space. So if it's scattered through space, because it's an explosion, we should be able to see remnants of an explosion or at least the shock wave itself. So that shock wave goes back to us. We will be able to see it as some sort of radiation which is at a uniform distance all throughout above, below, or to the side of the Earth. That is what we call the cosmic background radiation. That is actually the first evidence of the Big Bang. Now, it has been predicted by the Big Bang theory, but it only discovered in 1965. That gives credence to the predictive power of the Big Bang theory. Predict a light wall at the time the universe became transparent and matter begins to form. In other words, if you were there during the Big Bang, at one light minute, it means the distance that light travels through one minute, that's the only thing that you will be able to see. At one light hour, distance that light travels during an hour, that's the extent of the things that you'll be able to see. But right now, the cosmic background radiation comes from, four, from around 14 billion light years away. That means... That if the light took 14 billion light years, light years to get to us, then the universe is at least 14 billion light years old. So to, to say otherwise, we'll just say that light, the speed of light, has actually been drastically changed, which we have not really observed, and we have no good reason to suppose so. Now, this is, again, is data gained from Wilkinson micro, Microwave Anistropic Probe in the COBE, Cosmic Background Explorer Satellite. So two probes that we have sent out um, throughout the years to be able to collect real experimental data. A universal expansion, we know that the universe already expands. Nobody actually contests this. Galaxies and clusters are moving away at a speed consistent with their distance to us. Farther objects are more redshifted. That means if light from an object is redshifted, that mean, it means it's moving or receding from us at a very, very fast speed. And beyond that speed, it can actually approach the speed of light. Beyond the speed of light, we will not be able to see it anymore. Why? Because light will not be able to get to us. It's like shooting a car. Uh, it's like shooting somebody from car that is going away from you, and the car is going faster than the speed of the bullet itself. The bullet will never reach us. Okay. So, also, one evidence of the Big Bang is because... It's because there should be an abundance of lightweight elements. The Big Bang theory predicts an abundance such as hydrogen and helium. Incidentally, if we look at our own galaxy, hydrogen has 74, uh, the galaxy has 74% hydrogen, is composed of 24% helium, and the rest only composed 2%. This is because the high energy concentration during the beginning of the universe would have prevented heavy elements to form. Protons and neutrons are the only thing that exists, and they exist independently. It's only when the, it's only when the universe cooled down that uh, the energy or the, the uh, primordial matter was able to actually clump together to form the subatomic particles and form atoms and eventually form compounds. The elements that we know right now are combined in stars, mostly involving fusion of hydrogen, helium, and other elements. We know this because we already have the science of spectrography in which we are able to filter the light coming from the stars and we will be able to know what kind of elements are in them. Now, I have already given a background of what the uh, under cosmological model is. Uh, now, many other volumes. But this is only given because I, want, I would like to show and to illustrate how science advances. Now, what is science? Science is actually a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. Okay? Typically, this is a special kind of knowledge as a, from other knowledge like philosophy or like intuition because it has a special epistemic status awarded by a specific method that we use. It's called scientific method. 
the scientific method is a body of techniques used for investigating phenomena, and we are able to acquire new knowledge, and we are able to correct our previous uh, by integrating previous knowledge. Okay, science by itself is self-correcting. If we look at the scientific method, the steps are asking a question, observing or doing research, constructing a hypothesis, testing that hypothesis with an experiment working on a specific procedure and testing whether that procedure yields consistent results. Because if it does not, then the procedure is wrong. If the procedure yields consistent results, then we analyze data and draw conclusions with that. If the results align with the hypothesis, then we communicate the results in the form of a theory. If the results do not align with the hypothesis, then we reject the hypothesis and create another one. Thus, we uh, improve and we draw on previous knowledge for us to be able to get new knowledge. In other words, when science explains, it does not input something that is unknown. It explains what is unknown by means of what we already know. Now, the question, what differentiates science from non-science from pseudoscience? Okay. Uh, Don, Don. What's up? Cut lang muna kita. Sobrang naroon sa oras sabi ni Tess. Ah, uh, test yung yung ba yung ano, yung 25 minutes kasama na yung uh, opening statement. Uh, oh. Yes. Yes. So, we now proceed sa uh, cross examination. So, uh, Sir Eric will now uh, tama ba? So, we now proceed sa ano, Don will now cross examine Sir Eric kasi siya yung naunang mag ano, mag uh, salita kanina. So, Don, you can now ask questions, uh, two major questions lang with follow-ups, and then Sir Eric span with, uh, within 10 minutes. So, siguro kung may sobra pang oras, pwede yung additional question. Uh, two major questions. Uh, questions am I allowed to give? Uh, two major questions with follow-ups po. Two major questions. Uh, with follow-ups. Okay. Within 10 minutes po. Uh, Kasampi okay. yung reply niya, no, ni Sir Eric. Sir Eric, are you still there? Yes, I am. I am here. Uh, Can you hear me? Uh, sa, nasa portion na po tayo ng cross-examination. Tas, kasi po si Don, uh, ano na kayo magsalita kanina, si Don naman ngayon ang magko-cross-examine. Tapos kayo mamaya. Uh, Thank you. Okay, Sir Don. Okay. Uh, Mr. Eric. Hello, Mr. Eric. Good evening. Hello, Don. I'm yes. here. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Thank you giving... Thank you for giving the opportunity for both of us to speak. Now I'm going to ask several questions related to your speech. Now, unfortunately, hindi ko nap- napakinggan lahat eh, kasi napuputol-putol tayo. But I have first this major question. Okay. So you mentioned that your primary authority that you recommend is the uh, the Bible, right? You consider it as right, it needs updating, it is practically infallible. In fact, the writers knew about everything even before scientists knew about it, right? I said that, yes. Okay. So, if science is a way to be able to continue to advance, then how will you reconcile it um, with the infallibility of the Bible? Supposedly, science is supposed to be false. able to put something that is infallible in a discipline that is supposed to be fundamentally fallible and self-correcting. So, uh, the question is... Can you just um, well, summarize them? Yep. Mm, well, it's very simple actually. Science is supposed to be self-correcting. It is so supposed to be in. Uh, it's supposed to be fallible. How do you reconcile that with your apparent claim that the Bible is already infallible? Okay. So, um, of course, there are a couple of assumptions that you made there. The first assumption is that the Bible is fallible since it's written by men. But I do no, believe no, no. that. I, I'm, I'm saying that. You're claiming that the Bible is infallible. I see. Is, okay. If it is taken as true, then it mm-hmm. won't be con- it won't be compatible with science because supposedly science is self-correcting. It is very fallible, and that's one of the hallmarks of a scientific theory. Okay. Again, you're assuming there that uh, the Bible is not self-correcting. It cannot make predictions. I, of course, no. object to that. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not no, understanding I'm, I'm your question correctly. Mm-hmm. If, if something is infallible, it cannot be self-correcting because it's already correct. That's right. That's right. So in other words, if science is fundamentally fallible and the Bible is fundamentally infallible, 
is it possible for the Bible to be scientific? Um, I'm not sure if I said that the science science is fundamentally fallible. Did I say that? I don't remember. No, you saying. didn't. But okay. actually, that's one of the definitions of science because that's why yes. we do experiments. All right. I really don't know where the question is getting, but as I, you're, you're saying that science, as you understand it or as it is defined now, is it self-correcting? It's fallible. That's why we do experiments. Um, we make observations and make hypotheses out of those observations. And then the Bible is infallible. I think that's how I understand your your question. Yes, yes. That's right. So, um, yeah, science, again, um, I apo- I, I'm an, an apologetic apologist. Without God, we can't even have science. So, um, science was born out of... Uh, the knowledge of the Bible, for example, Sir Isaac Newton, I mentioned about him earlier, and he was a devout Christian. He actually, uh, not many people know that he wrote more on theology than on science. I think he wrote 80% theology and 20% science. So, um, yeah. yes, so science is indeed um, fallible, and that's why we do experiments. We cannot just say it is something, something, just because we think it is. But the Bible has never mm-hmm. been wrong. Well, at least I think that it's never been proven wrong anyway. It has made prophecies that have come true. So, yes, I, I stick to my statement. Mm. So, basically, you're saying that science is fallible, the Bible is infallible, right? Well, all methods of man are fallible. I think you would agree with me uh-huh. with that. Um, all yes, methods yes. of man. And that includes, of course, the scientific method, yes. Mm, I see. So, in that case, don't you agree that the Bible it by itself is not really a scientific treatise because it's all it already treats its contents as absolutely true and not really subject to questioning, not subject to falsifying, not really subject to corroboration because you already, we're already assuming that the Bible is 100% true. Then uh, I wouldn't, uh, I probably, I'm speaking for myself, I would assume that it's true, it's from God. It's one of his two revelations. Mm-hmm. We have the general lever- revelation, which is nature, and mm-hmm. we have the special revelation, which is the Bible. And I believe that it, it, it's infallible. Uh, from Genesis to Revelation, I believe in all the 66 books. So my authority comes from the Bible. You may not have your authority from the Bible. The secular scientists mm-hmm. may not have the authority from the Bible, but 100% I agree. I am convinced, and since I'm doing also New Testament reliability research, that uh, the Bible is true, it's reliable in everything that it says. And that includes science. Yeah, actually I have no question about that. I'm not talking about truth. Remember, I'm so I'm just simply asking whether the Bible could be considered as scientific. The truth of the Bible is beyond the question. Remember that some things that are true are not scientific, and some things that are scientific are not necessarily true. That's why we have disproven theories that are scientific. Well, from my point of view, that's a category mistake, I think, um, Mr. Don Pius, because you're assuming that the Bible and science are, can be both on equal um, levels. I, I, don't, I, I, I argue that the Bible is uh, on a much higher plane compared to science. So mm-hmm. for me, for me anyway, it's a category mistake to uh, to lump science along with the Bible when the Bible is actually the authority of everything since it comes from God and science would only be secondary. Science proves the Bible and not the other way around. Mm-hmm. Okay, I see. So you're saying that the Bible is not necessarily science, but science well, is supposed science. to be able to prove the Bible. It also includes correct? philosophy. It includes... Um, um, all other things. It includes epistemology, Hello? how do we know what we know, uh, things like that. So science is just one of the things Hello? that the Bible says. Hello, Don. Hello, Don. So, uh, si Sir Eric, para I stopped I stop. the time. We have 3 minutes, 20 seconds. Uh, pang 3 minutes. So, uh, habang hindi natin mag-reconnect, siguro i-call ko ulit yung group para hindi natin kung matakot na ulit. Do I get to ask the second question? Hindi pa. Uh, hindi pa po siya makakonect si Sir, Sir Eric. Uh, okay. Okay. 
Because of that, the Bible is outside the realm of science. Or okay, rather, it transcends I, science. I, yeah, yeah, but I think I made my point earlier that uh, we cannot do science without the Bible, and the science is born out of the Word of God. The reason why we can do science is because of God and because of His Word. So, um, well, well, that's that. Mm. Well, that would be a, a uh, an assertion which could be ascertained by our viewers, but rather, at least you were able to to say that. Now. Am I allowed to give a second question, or do I wait until you will ask a question for me first? Um, uh, who is the moderator? Okay. Um, there's still one minute left, one minute and 36 seconds, actually. So, um, uh, Don, are you done with the cross-examination? Well, I was just supposed to be able to ask one more question. Okay. Uh, if, if I will be allowed. Okay, go ahead. Ah, okay, okay. So, uh, Eric, in your opinion, or rather based on what you know, how would you uh, distinguish between a legitimate science and a pseudoscience? Um, pseudoscience wouldn't employ, for example, the scientific method. It would just make um, you know, hypothesis not based on observations, um, something that doesn't follow the scientific method. So that would be pseudoscience for me. Ah, uh, okay. So no experimentation, simply observation, uh, and no observation. So it, it would take everything based on authority, right? Yeah. I see. Okay. So I think that would be my last question. I'm glad that's answered. Okay. Um, Sir Eric? Uh, it is your turn to cross-examine, Mr. Don Paez. Uh, rebuttal. Okay. Rebuttal. Oh, rebuttal first. Uh -oh. Mamaya na cross-examination. So, sa okay. rebuttal, uh, mostly answers lang ng ano. Yung hindi na-address kanina uh, questions si Don, uh, Sir Eric can answer the questions within, within the given time. Okay. I see. Can I have a rebuttal of the opening statement of, of Don, not necessarily yeah. an answer to this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But support within 10 minutes. And also Don... Within 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes okay. starts right. now. All right. So thank you to Don. Um, I apologize if I wasn't able to answer your questions um, properly. I, I, I'm not going to blame the, the signal. You can probably blame me for not understanding your question. So um, you mentioned in your opening statement, uh, you actually gave us the development of the history of the Big Bang, which is also something that I'm familiar with because I just did a lecture on the, the improbability of the Big Bang theory at a high school here in our city about a couple of, uh, probably three weeks ago, um, including the explanation of why we have redshifts and how it explains the expansion of the universe. Now, you mentioned about the... LCDM or the Lambda um, CDM is the prevailing cosmological model, and it's a it's a good model. Well, I I I would argue that it's not. It's actually an ailing standard uh, model. It's based on a lot of um, fudge factors like you know the dark energy and dark matter, which we haven't observed yet. Um, and then also there are okay. I've got to mention five here. Five that we observe and five that are actually unknown. Number one is the galaxy redshift. We observe that. And, um, well, secular scientists explain that as an expansion of space. Maybe that's true. So we see redshift. Number two is the CMB radiation, the cos cosmic microwave background, also called the CBR, or the cosmic background radiation. We observe that. And the secularists explain that as uh, the afterglow of the Big Bang. Um, a lot of astrophysicists and astronomers actually say that that's a weak prediction and not necessarily an evidence for the Big Bang. Number three, um, what we observe are perceived motions of stars in the disks of spiral galaxies. And secularists explain that with dark matter, which again we do not observe. So that also falls under the fudge factor. Distant supernovae, plural for supernova, getting dimmer than expected. 
Um, so uh, the conclusion from secular is it's an accelerating universe and explained by dark energy, which we also don't observe. And then the flatness and the isotropy, um, meaning same in all directions, is explained by the inflation, which is, of course, another invented theory. Now, um, Don mentioned about um, the lightweight elements. Those are the very first elements that were uh, present during the initial expansion. You have hydrogen, helium, possibly a bit of lithium. All right. But one of the biggest questions is, um, how do you get from hydrogen, helium, and a bit of lithium, probably even beryllium, to all the elements in the table of periodic table of elements? How many do we have now? Probably about 118, I'm not really sure. So scientists use what we call um, circular reasoning in trying to explain that. But this is how they do it. So um, like, it's like a sleight of hand. So they say that, all right, during the initial um, expansion, there were only uh, two elements, or maybe three. Um, a lot of hydrogen, helium, and then a bit of lithium, and probably even lithium, beryllium. And then they are asked, so how do you get the other elements in the periodic table? Well, they would now say they, have, they are the results of nuclear fusion. And then we ask, where did the nuclear fusion happen? And then they would say, in the stars. I see. Where do the stars come from? From the initial explosion, of course, as a result of the Big Bang. So, as, as you can see, it's a cir it's circular reasoning. You don't even have um, you don't even have um, any evidence of what we call population three stars. Okay, population three stars. No, 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 uh, no evidence at all. And they say that there's, we're supposed to see population three stars if uh, we believe in the in the Big Bang Theory. And we don't see them. We don't see them. So again, you start with hydrogen, we start with helium, and a bit of lithium. Those are the lightest elements, probably, that you can find in the universe. How do you get from those light elements to, to heavy elements, for example, like oxygen and, 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 and carbon? Um, so that's really circular reasoning that the um, uh, Big Bang cosmologists are, are employing. And also, population three uh, stars are supposed to be stars that do not have um, metals. They do not have metals. So again, the secularists uh, go to a rescuing device, and they would say that, well, um, it was caused by the inflation. That explains it. It explains the flatness problem. It explains the magnetic monopoles. When you say magnetic monopoles, it's supposed to be produced by the initial expansion, which was very high, and... Um, a magnetic monopole. When, when you see a magnet, you have two poles, right? You have north and the south. And uh, you won't find a magnetic monopole. And uh, the intense um, heat uh, during the, uh, the supposed Big Bang, the expansion of the supposed Big Bang, is supposed to have been produced magnetic monopoles. But since we don't find that, the secular scientists would uh, go to a rescuing device. They, they always go back to the inflation area theory, which uh, of course is still not proven. So um, that's that. That's another thing. Okay. So, and then uh, there's also the problem with the, with quasars. Quasars are short for a quasi um, stellar radio source. So um, quasars are also a big problem for the Big Bang theory, according to astronomers. Um, there was a recently discovered group of quasars. They called it LQG, a large group of large quasar group, and it exceeds in size anything previously believed possible. So that, of course, would require a fundamental revision of the prevailing cosmological theory. The real mystery, though, is how the scientific uh, the scientific media um, failed to acknowledge that discoveries of this sort were predicted by one of the 20th century's leading astronomers, Alton. Halton Art, but he was he wasn't uh, there, he wasn't given a lot of attention. Um, many years ago, Art observed that astronomers were misinterpreting quasar redshift, placing these objects at the boundaries supposed to be of observable space. The problem is, just recently, a quasar was discovered to be part of a galaxy. All right, how can that be? A highly redshifted quasar embedded in a galaxy that is just low-shifted. 
Okay, but the secular scientists again run to a uh, a rescuing device. They say, "Oh, it's actually behind the galaxy." That's what we see. We see the quasar, highly redshifted, so they're far away, and the galaxy is uh, closer to us because they are low shifted, low redshifted. Now here's the problem. They actually saw um, um, jet streams, um, sort of tail ending the quasar. It means that the quasar is being ejected out of the galaxy, which means that the quasar, the quasi stellar radio source, is actually part, physically part of, of, of the galaxy. So that's uh, another problem, probably an intractable problem from, for the Big Bang Theory. Um, the Big Bang Theory violates the basic law of conservation of mass and energy. It states that you cannot energy cannot be destroyed or or created, right? That's why we have the equation E is equal mc squared. You can convert energy into mass and vice versa. Um, so matter also would have been evenly distributed, there, but there are clusters of stars and great voids and uh, other issues. You cannot gas. You cannot get from gas to solid objects like dust, for example. An expanding cloud of gas will not reverse its expansion and collapse into solid objects. That won't happen. That would be absurd. You cannot get uh, from dust to planets, of course. If enough dust collects to form small pebbles, the pebbles will collide too quickly, right? And then they begin to break each other up and then return to dust. According to Martin Harwit from Astrophysical Concepts, he said, once these planetesimal asteroids have been formed, further growth of planets may occur through their gravitational accretion into large bodies. Just how that takes place is not understood. So that's, again, an example of a story that's trying to fit into the, the observations. And then, of course, you cannot get from planet to stars. Star formation has never been observed. It's, it's uh, perhaps the weakest link in the stellar evolution theory. Abraham Loeb of Harvard Center for Astrophysics says, the truth is we don't, know underst we don't understand star formation at a very fundamental level. And again, I will ask, where did the four, universes, four universal forces come from? The weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force, gravity, electromagnetic force, right? Something cannot create itself. That's not possible. Uh, even philosophically speaking, that's not possible. So I will end my rebuttal there. Okay, thank you, uh, Sir Eric. Uh, now, Don, you now can cross-examine Don uh, within the given, um, uh, given time. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, how uh, many minutes do I have? I, I think, no, I mean, Sir Eric can now cross-examine you. Uh, oh, oh, it's my turn. Okay. okay. And after that, you will have your rebuttal uh, within 10 minutes. Okay. So, cross-examination lang po, uh, Sir Eric, within mm -hmm. minutes. Uh, Thank you. Including na yung reply ni Sir Don. So, to make your questions po. Okay, Don, good evening again. Um, Hi. Let's see. I'm a very Hi, simple man with simple thoughts. So I just a very, ask a very simple question. Hello, the Eric. question actually is both uh, scientific and, and uh, philosophical question. Um, Hi, Don. Nawala sila parehas. Okay na ba? Don? Sir Eric, okay na? Yeah, uh, okay, uh, I'll call again the group. Uh, mayroon natin tech. Uh, Sir John? Hello? Yeah, Don. Uh, Don here. Oh, si Sir Eric naman ang nawala. <laughs> <laughs> connection natin today. Anyway. Kasalanan to ng PLD. Tika lang talaga may may button. Siguro. Sinasabotage tayo ni God. Siguro dapat sa sunod ano ang PLD. Sasabihin ko sa atin yan eh. I'm using uh, Globe. So this is Hello? This is an advertisement. Medyo <laughs> 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 ba? Dawa ko wala. Oh, hi. Welcome back Mr. Eric. So, Alright. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, you can, you can probably blame me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ten minutes again. All right, so I was, as I was saying, I'm a simple guy with simple thoughts. Um, I'm not a philosopher like Don, so. But anyway, the question is uh, both scientific and philosophical. So my question would be, um, uh, Don, do you actually believe that um, because the Big Bang 
hinges on um, singularity, meaning there was a point in time where everything started, um, including energy and, and matter, even time, and even space. Mm-hmm. So can, do you, can you, um, do you actually believe that um, everything came from nothing or something can come out of nothing? Sorry, everything that something can come out of nothing. Something well, it's can not come that out I believe uh, it's so. However, yeah, it's, it's not something that I would really be say I believe, but I'm inclined to accept that that would be the case. Because okay. uh, well, that is what uh, is normally uh, w- what that is what is normally shown right now in scientific journals. And um, and you believe that if uh, that that's not proven, then the whole thing collapses, right? No, not really. Because in the philosophy of science, uh, you can question a theory actually, but uh, it still depends. So if you if you're familiar with Thomas Kuhn, it says that a theory is not necessarily uh, it doesn't necessarily die because uh, people are still prone to biases of, out of believing it. So it's only when there's a scientific revolution or a paradigm shift or the keepers of the old guard all die off, that's usually when the time of theory uh, becomes uh, discredited. Well, that all sounds good, but again, the question is, do you believe that something can cannot come out of nothing? Mm, yeah, for now, I think, yes. Okay, so, um, but you accept that nobody was there, of course, during the... Uh, so-called initial explosion. Nobody was there 13.7 billion years ago. And we know that we can only extrapolate to a certain point. Do you agree, would you agree, if I say that um, that couldn't have happened, that something could have come out of nothing, no matter the explanation about quantum fluctuations at the beginning? Well, God should uh, supposedly came out of nothing. I mean, I'm looking I'm at the uh, view of the... God could have come out of nothing. Um, sorry, um, Since, okay, you're uh, a philosopher, we're not Don. we to the atheistic worldview here. Don, huh? you're a philosopher. You know the fallacy of two quo quay? No, no, well, that's no, no, really no. using it. I'm, I'm asking, Don, I'm really... asking, I'm asking. I'm just asking for the benefit of our listeners. Huh? Do you know the fallacy of two quo quay? Yes, of course. All right, two quo quay means that it says that um, instead of answering a question, you... Uh, return with a criticism of your own uh, against the person asking. So, do you think that would fall under oh, two no, kokoe? I'm not really... No. A two kokoe... But you didn't answer my question. You I'm said, that, what about God? Your... Okay, I'll read yes, to you two Yes, I did. Kokoe. I said, God, I think it's possible for God. I think it's possible yeah. for God to exist. Why? Because I'm not talking about the atheistic view, but simply the standard view, which is accepted by some taste as well. I'm not even asking about, um, um, we're, we're talking about young earth, we're talking about the cosmological model. I haven't even gone yes. into the, uh, the God question. Yes, so if, if, when, if it, uh, it so, so happens that I am a theistic old, or old earth uh, or, a nat- or a theistic evolutionist, I would say that, yes, I believe that something could come from nothing because I believe in God. So you believe in God? If it so happens that I believe in God, yes. All right, but okay. So you wouldn't admit that admit that what you did was a two quay. No, it's not. All right, I'll read the two quay for the benefit of our listeners. Here's the the definition yes. of uh, two quay. It's avoiding having to engage with criticism by turning it back on the accuser, answering criticism with criticism. Mm-hmm. I was asking you if you actually mm-hmm. believe that something can come out of nothing, and then you answered me by saying, well, God can come out of nothing, can't he? Something to that effect. So, again, I would ask, Don, would you admit that that was a two quo quay? That was a fallacy of two quo quay? No, that's it not. Was. Why? Uh, right, because if fine. I were... I did not. If if I were uh, a uh, somebody who believes in God and yet believes in the standard model, that's not incompatible, right? All right, that's fine. Let's just leave it at that. All right, All right on, on to my um, next uh, question now, and I also hope I can have follow-up questions as well. Um, 
so this is scientific. We're both not experts, but I'm 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 not sure if you've read about the everything that you can possibly get your hands on about the CMB radiation. So my question is, can we really trust that the CMB or the cosmic microwave background radiation is from a background source? I'm sorry, what's the last part? Is our background really, source? Can we really trust that the cosmic microwave background radiation is from a background source? Mm, okay. The answer is if you ask it in an absolute manner, uh, meaning is it true or is it absolutely true, I would say no. However, it is the best explanation that we have so far. Okay. And um, to follow up on that, the problem with the cosmic microwave background is uh, what we call the, um, the horizon problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. The CMB radiation, it has been measured to be uniform to one part in 100,000. The question is, how could this be so if the radiation has not had sufficient time to traverse? I think you've answered, you've uh, mentioned about this earlier, but I'll ask again for the benefit um, edification of our listeners. How could this mm -hmm. be so that uh, the temperature is unif it's uniform, I think around 3 degrees Kelvin, if the radiation yeah. has not had sufficient time to traverse the greatest distances in the universe so that it can sort of um, even out? the temperature by transmitting energy from hot regions to cold. Mm -hmm. That's the horizon problem. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I, I didn't really okay. get it the first All time. All right, the, um, the CMB has been measured, mm -hmm. and you say that it's one of the good... Because um, um, for a good model to work, it has to have good... Um, explanatory powers. I'm sure you would agree. Yes. Right? And good predictive powers. All right. So the CMB has been measured to be uniform to one part in 100,000, around three degrees Kelvin. Yes, yes. The question mm. is, how could this be? This is the horizon problem. How could this be? So, if the radiation mm. has not had sufficient time to traverse, to cross the greatest distances in the universe, um, so that it could even out the temperature by transmitting energy from hot regions to cold. How can it be that we have the same temperature all over the observable universe? Well, uh, if I were a scientist, or rather if I were to adopt the view of a scientist, I would say I wouldn't know, but I would be glad to find out. We need more observational data for that. Okay. So, um, how many? Two minutes. All right. So, I mentioned about the circular reasoning that are used by secular scientists, Don. How would you explain mm -hmm. the abundance of other elements when we only started supposedly with just helium and hydrogen at the beginning? And then they mm -hmm. say that, you know, the other elements were fused in the sort of the furnaces of the stars. And then, of course, mm -hmm. you ask where did the stars come from, from the initial explosions at the circular. So, how do you explain mm -hmm. the other elements that we have now? Um, other than uh, hydrogen and uh, helium and probably a bit of lithium. Hmm. You're familiar with the process called uh, nuclear enrichment? Uh, I'm familiar with nuclear fusion. That's what they uh, oh. say was the production of the other elements. I'm not familiar with nuclear uh, uh, enrichment. Production? En enrichment. Enrich enrichment, yes. Well, it's a process where normally uranium-235 is enriched to become uh, uranium-238. So you add a few, um, a few, uh, what's this? You add more energy and you create another mm -hmm. isotope. So what happens there is you simply change the makeup or the internal makeup of an element. Remember what are just the elementary particles. You just have protons, neutrons, electrons. It's just like playing Lego. Okay. So if you want, carbon? for example... Mm -hmm. You talked about oh, uranium. What about carbon? Yeah, what uh, uh, carbon has? What? How many? What's the atomic number of carbon? Eight. Anyway, I think I'll end my question. We only have twenty-four seconds. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. Oh yeah. Anyway, like I said, it's just like Lego. You just recombine elementary particles. Okay, uh, Don. It's your. Since 20 seconds na lang. Uh, I guess you can al already start your uh, rebuttal. Uh, in 10 minutes uh, fully for your rebuttal. Okay. I think, uh, uh, well, first of all, before I, uh, I give a rebuttal, let me just give an observation. It's like I'm watching a movie of ancient aliens. 
I was just saying that, well, the standard cosmological model cannot explain this, therefore, maybe, I'm not saying it's aliens, but maybe. It sounds like that. But then again, with regards to my rebuttal, um, well, two main points. Uh, I'm supposed to give a rebuttal or uh, an interrogation? Uh, rebuttal. Okay, already. A rebuttal, okay. Yeah. Well, two, two main points, actually. Um... This whole debate is not really an issue about really, I, I would agree with Eric, it's not really about hard facts, but about worldviews. I'm arguing from the scientific worldview, and he's arguing from the religious worldview. That is because, like I asked him, there's a definition of science, and then there's a definition of uh, pseudoscience. With, he says that pseudoscience approaches problems by accepting things, uh, not because of the scientific method. So it's based on authority mostly. Now, which authority? Um, well, if you look at the story that I mentioned earlier, science does not treat anything as an authority. Nothing is sacred to science. You question everything. On the other hand, pseudoscience treats something as an infallible authority. What could that be? Maybe it would be the Bible. Maybe it could be other religious texts. Maybe it could be a textbook that could be treated as infallible. So because science is not infallible and the Bible is infallible, we cannot consider the Bible as legitimate science. Yes, it can be true, but like I said, that's not necessarily a criterion for science. The criterion for science, if we really look at it, would be that it's verifiable. You can really look at it. Um, if somebody says a, a scientific statement like the stars are made up of uh, these elements, then you could go to a spectroscope, look at the star, and look at the elements. You don't need to look at, take it at face value. Science is also falsifiable, meaning a theory can be invalidated by a properly presented counterexample. If we go to creationism, we can find no counterexample because it is already taken as an absolute truth. Science is testable. It is possible to experiment on, and results can either falsify or corroborate the theory. Creationism needs no corroboration because it's already taken at face value and at absolute truth. And science is predictive. Remember that the cosmic background radiation was predicted by science. Okay? Uh, now, the Bible says that it could predict something, but it's the same way as a feng shui master would predict things. And lastly, science is disinterested, meaning whatever the result then science would accept it. It follows the evidence wherever it goes, and it does not have a specific agenda. In fact, science has nothing to lose if we just so happen to find that God really is the cause of the universe. That's fine if we really find that out. But so far, it's not yet the case. As opposed to science, you, the science, generalize, generally emphasize a belief in an infallible authority, or rather authorities, that only a handful have exclusive access to the truth. And somehow... Other people are being blocked or there's some sort of conspiracy going on to hide the truth. It relies mostly on unrepeatable experiments. Okay? So that phenomenon or even consist, uh, component events cannot be reproduced even under controlled ex experiments. Now, we have tried reproducing the Big Bang. That's why we have the Large Hadron Collider, right? Also, pseudoscience handpicks their examples. There is more emphasis on the exceptions rather than the norm. For example, we see scientist X, who is a Nobel Prize winner, believes in creationism. Never mind the, the sheer amount of scientists that don't believe in creationism. You've heard of Project Steve, right? For every Steve um, that doesn't believe, well, I think Project Steve has uh, around 14,000 members, and that comprises around 1% of the scientific community or so. Lastly, which is a hallmark of uh, pseudoscience, is that explanations are abandoned without replacement. You only focus on the negative side. You don't really posit a theory that is better, an alternative that is better. Rationing doesn't really explain anything. It just says that, well, um, the secularist science doesn't explain this, can't explain this, therefore God. Somebody once said, well, uh, you can't explain the tide. Tide goes in, tide goes out. You can't explain that. Okay. So that is the hallmark of a pseudoscience. Anyway, specifically for creationism, cre believes in the sole in inerrant authority of the Bible and it's poised to prove its truth. It does not, uh, science does not prove truth. Science only discovers truth. Creation believes that creation is a one-time process and it cannot be ra naturally replicated. Otherwise, if it, if it could, then we would have replicated it already. 
it appeals to the supernatural, which cannot be verified nor experimented upon. In fact, we do not have any rules of the supernatural. It brushes away falsifying information that's based on misunderstanding of what has been revealed. I mean, when was the last time you've heard a talking snake or a talking donkey or even a talking animal for that matter? And lastly, it highlights the insufficiency of recognized scientific theories, legitimate ones, to explain all data without really providing anything better. So that being said, I think that would be all the rebuttals that I need. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, closing, closing arguments na? Closing arguments na siguro, uh, Sir Eric, ulit ang closing argument, and then first, mm -hmm. and, mag, and then last, last ka dun sa closing argument, and then we will go to open forum from our moderators and from our listeners. So, Sir Eric, you can now have your closing uh, statement. Five minutes, okay, thank you. All right, my time starts now. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, thank you, thanks again to Don, to uh, Homer, Beth, Tess, and the rest, and all those who tuned in tonight. Um, okay, well, I, I hate to uh, bring this up. But, you know, Don mentioned just a uh, false dichotomy there between religion and science and um, talking serpents and you know, the like. It's really old arguments. It doesn't really address the issue. So I don't think it was necessary. Anyway. I believe in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. He has made everything appropriate in its time, according to Ecclesiastes 3.11. Uh, Jeremiah 10.12 says, but God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. You can take my arguments that I presented with a grain of salt or do the research yourself. Google is there and Google is your friend. Skeptics often claim the Bible is not a science textbook. Well, that of course is true. Because science textbooks change every year, whereas the Bible is the unchanging word of God. The God who cannot lie, who was there at the beginning. Nevertheless, the Bible can be relied upon when it touches on every scientific issue, including cosmology. It is the Bible that gives us the big picture. Within this big picture, we can build scientific models that help us explain how past events may have come about. You know, I can give you all the good scientific arguments, which I think I did, but they won't, they won't convince you if your mind is close to the truth. Romans 1, 8, 20 states, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of man who suppress the truth and unrighteousness speaks that which is not about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world is invisible, attributes of eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Colossians 2.8 tells us, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. I am an apologetic apologist. I am a passionate and dedicated servant of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Weiner Heisenberg, a German theoretical physicist and one of the key pioneers of quantum mechanics, said the first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will turn you into an atheist, but at the bottom of the glass, oh God is waiting for you. So if there are atheists listening and believers, well, there are no atheists actually. An atheist denies God in the same manner that a criminal denies the police. Okay, uh, the uh, sir, are you still there? Hello? Yeah. How uh, many minutes are Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to So, I'm going to Albert Einstein said that there are only two ways of looking at the. Okay. Uh, Albert Einstein said that there are only Call call yung group apa para Somebody here? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, yeah, I think it's Eric. We're waiting for Eric, right? Hello. Magla-love segment na lang daw ulit si Rick. 
Dr. Love. <laughs> well, what happened to the people? Closing closing arguments na eh. <laughs> Oo nga eh. To the listeners, uh, sorry, uh, sorry for the ano. Sorry for the inconvenience. There will be an open forum after this. Yes. Um. Um. Uh, uh, there. Uh, they will be addressed to a specific speaker, and then the the speaker will be able to answer that in two minutes. The other speaker will be given a chance to um, answer ng one minute in the same question, if he wants to. Yeah. 30 minutes open forum. So, where did everybody go? Hello. Hello, Ted. Hello. Yeah, kanina pa kami ng tito. Oh, what? Ako na gusto na. Anyway. Hello, Mark. Kala ko maglalab segment na kami dito eh. <laughs> <laughs> Teka, ah, pwedeng i-drop ko muna muna. Ako, ako yung tatawag sa group. Okay. Oh. Okay. Alright. Thanks for your closing. I see. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. As I was saying, um, what was I? So, um, Albert Einstein said that there are only two ways of looking at the universe. Either that everything is a miracle or nothing is. This means this means either it was created by God or it wasn't. Law of non-contradiction. So, um, it's, if it's uh, if it's not created by God, then it will or just bags of chemicals wandering about in a purposeless universe. It's all just time and chance acting on matter. All just a random result of millions of years of undirected mutations. There's no morality, and everyone is free to do what he wants. Um, however, if the universe was created by God and if He created us, then He owns us, and we are accountable to Him if we don't follow His commands. So um, I would be rem- remiss with my duty as a Christian if I don't share the gospel. But the reason why I believe in the young earth is because I believe in the Bible. I believe that all of sin falls short of the glory of God. The only way we can be reconciled with God is if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He uh, was born of a virgin, died for our sins, rose again after three days so that he can save us. And I believe that's the more important um, thing to share tonight. We may have different views of uh, cosmological models, but in the end, it's all about following his his commands and truly believing in him. So I hope that he extends his grace upon you so that you can also repent of your sins and have faith in Jesus Christ alone. Thank you and God bless. Okay, thank you, Sir Eric. Uh, closing statement na, Mr. Don, and then we proceed to the open time. Sir Don, are you there? Yes, good evening. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for um, allowing me to give my piece on the matter and give the arguments in support of the standard cosmological model. Um, I also speak not only for atheists, secularists, but also for the theistic evolutionist and also for the uh, the group of Father Lemaitre, Lemaitre. So even for those who believe in God but accept that the standard cosmological theory is correct, now, just a few points. I just want to say that regardless of what you believe, science is science. Pseudoscience will always be pseudoscience. Pseudoscience approaches a problem by accepting things almost solely based on authority and not necessarily the scientific method. Science is fallible. The Bible is considered to be infallible. If the Bible is a primary authority and science is only secondary, then the Bible does not need to hijack the authority of science. It can stand on its own. So the science is very dangerous because it purports to be scientific. Ah, this connected again to Time stop, Muna. Sir Don. Okay. Uh, meron pa siyang 3 minutes and 4 minutes. Yeah, okay na. Just uh, connected ka na ulit, Sir Don. Yeah. Uh, Saan part yung naput? Yung hijacking science. Yeah, okay. Um, so the Bible does not need to hijack the authority of science. 
pseudo science is dangerous because it purports to be scientific when it's actually not. Now, science does not purport to prove anything. In fact, the main purpose of science is perhaps to disprove itself. It is disinterested in the result. Whether it may be uh, supported or whether it may be falsified, science does not care. It doesn't have an agenda. If we are going to compare um, legitimate science versus pseudoscience, and we're going to look at whether creationism is either, then we look. Is it verifiable? Is it falsifiable? Is it testable? Is it predictive? Is it disinterested? Or is the standard model more like that, as I've shown in the story earlier on how it was developed? Or when we talk about pseudoscience, does it ask you to believe in authority? Have unrepeatable experiments? Does it give a handpick examples? Does it regard uh, disregard information which may refute it? Are explanations abandoned without really giving anything? So, which fits more here in this uh, in this uh, description of pseudoscience? Is the stand is it the standard model or is it creationism? Because when we see that one is closer to being uh, pseudoscience than science. Well, as it's been said, if it looks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, then it must be a duck. And we can see that in the case of creationism, it, may, it seems that it is more of a pseudoscience than it's not. And that is why in the Scopes trial before, creationism or even intelligent design is treated as a pseudoscience. And that is why until now, there hasn't been anybody who has achieved any scientific award because of being a creationist. So that is my case. Thank you very much and have a good day. I'm opening um, the floor to questions. Okay, uh, open forum na tayo. Tess, meron bang questions dun sa website natin? Hello, Tess. Oh, okay. Um, uh, here's one from Peter. Um, question to both debaters. So what would make you change your current position regarding the origin of the universe? Uh, and then a comment. Ang pagkakaintindi ko, if Bible is inerrant and always true, why does it have to rely on science which is inherently fallible or subject to error? Okay, who wants to go first? Mm, I can go first. Okay. Don here. Well, as for the first question, what would make your change your current position regarding the origin of the universe, I would say a better theory that could account for the inconsistencies of the current theory. Just let's face it, it is science, it is fallible, it is not a perfect explanation, but it's the best inference that we have so far. Now, if it would be able to explain all the discrepancies and provide a better framework, then I'm very ready to change my mind. But the thing is, it's not enough simply to discredit or to destroy a theory. Like I said, you have to put something better. You have to provide a better... Uh, actually, comment lang yung, yung second niya. Um, oh, nga, oh, okay. Nga. Yeah. Yun, yun, yeah. Um, uh, repeat ko na lang ulit. Yung second, uh, if Bible is inerrant and always true, why does it have to rely on science which is inherently fallible or subject to error? See. Well, in my cases, I, I will just say it doesn't. Because sabi ko nga, science doesn't really care what is true, pero what is really, what is easily verifiable in light of current knowledge. Okay. Uh, Sir Eric? Although I have, I have two minutes also. Uh, yes, let me reset the timer first. Okay. Okay, you will also have two minutes to answer the, uh, the questions, okay? Uh, your time starts now. To the, quest, to the uh, question first, um, I, again, I'm an unapologetic apologist. I uh, believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. When the Bible says about something, I believe it's true and science can verify that. So um, if it doesn't fit the Bible, um, and I know that a lot of creationists um, astrophysicists, they have PhDs in astrophysics and molecular biology, so it's not pseudoscience. I just have to put that out. Um, so, it's um, if it doesn't fit the Bible, um, I would reject it. And uh, for the comment, um, I'm not really sure how to respond to that because um, again, science is born out of believing in, in, in the Bible. The Bible 
tells us, it makes prediction, it makes um, uh, prophecies, and um, so far they've all been true. And um, again, I go back, always go back to um, Sir Isaac Newton every time. Uh, the reason why he is into science is because he said he was after the mind of God. Um, he wanted to perform experiments, he wanted to do science because he wanted to know oh. more um, about God. So, um, again, that, that, that seemingly um, um, it, um, people are, it, it's, it, we're being indoctrinated that religion is against science. It's not anti science. Um, we have a lot of creationists who are scientists. And again, I mentioned Rame, Rame, Raymond the Median who invented the MRI. So I don't think it's correct to say that it's religious versus science. Um, we do science because of, of God. Apart from God, we can't even have knowledge. That's it. Um, you, you mentioned about predictions and prophecies. Can you mention a few, um, like, Maybe science discoveries that have been prophesied in the Bible. All right, I'll start with the Isaiah. Um, well, it's not even a prophecy. It was a more of a declarative statement in Isaiah forty twenty two. It is he who, um, I'm sorry, Isaiah forty twenty two. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. If you actually translate that um, uh, Hebrew word, it's. Uh, it's not really a circle. It, the real translation of the word is actually more spherical. So, and there was, there's another verse in Isaiah where it says he hangs it, he hangs it upon nothing. So, that was like um, um, way before we even were capable of traveling um, beyond, um, you know, extraterrestrially beyond Earth to see that the um, Earth is spherical. Prophecies. Well, there are a lot of prophecies in Isaiah. Uh, many of them, in fact, all of them have been um, also uh, fulfilled in, in Jesus, and uh, and he came to earth. So um, I don't have time to um, to enumerate all of them. Uh, actually, you do have, because uh, we have a 30-minute open forum. Oh, that's fine, because I'm only limited to two minutes, so I'll, I'll, I think I'll end it there. Two minutes per question. Yeah. Uh, Don, uh, by the way, the other... Other panelists could also ask. Uh, Santi, meron ka bang question, Santi? Mm-hmm. Or Don? Siguro si Don na lang. Question ka ba? Anyway, uh, recap ko lang yung question ni uh, Poging Peter ba yun, Tess? Kanina? Yes, si Poging Peter uh, yun. He was asking about yung... What, para, ito kasi yung question ni Poging Peter ay tinanong na rin doon sa Bill Nye at uh, Kinham debate. So, mm-hmm. right niya, no? sa side ni Sir Eric, uh, nothing could change his mind. Uh, as, lo- as long as na- nag-disagree to sa Bible, uh, it would not change his mind no matter how heavy the evidence would be. So, kahit doon naman, uh, if I'm correct, uh, sabi niya, yung, uh, depende rin sa evidence kasi yung science naman talaga is an ongoing process of discovering truth or facts. Mm-hmm. And then we also have the concept of anti-realism. So, uh, Don, yung, yung question ko na lang sa'yo, the direct. Uh, yung, uh, paki-explain nga yung concept na anti-realism uh, in science, uh, a philosophy of science. And I think it's also applicable here in our discussion. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I'm glad you asked about that, Homer. No? Anti-realism is a, well, it's a worldview within scientific worldview. Because you have two, the realist and the anti-realist. The realist uh, would accept that what science describes is reality itself. On the other hand, the anti-realist would say that our scientific knowledge is just a model of reality. Um, Einstein would illustrate it as something like you find a clock. Okay? And then when you find the clock, you can't open it. So what you do, you actually try to build it from how it appears. So you have two clocks that are identical from the outside, but you don't know whether the inside is identical because the original clock might suddenly behave or perform suddenly differently from the clock that you have made. And that is because what you have made is simply a model or an approximation based on your observation of the original clock. In the same manner, science is like that because it's based on observations on nature, on observed uh, regularities, which might not really be as regular as we want, 
then it is prone to making mistakes. And because it is prone to making mistakes, it can be improved. It can incorporate new data, uh, which is what is happening right now. If you look at science, again, an example by, uh, by Einstein, building a new scientific theory is not like um, mowing down a shack and then building a skyscraper. No. A, uh, developing a scientific theory is like climbing a mountain where when you climb up, you see your original position. You don't see it as wrong, but you see it as limited in light of the new perspective that you gained because of the new things that you have seen. That is why uh, Einsteinian physics did not say that Newton was wholly wrong. It simply developed on it. And quantum physics did not say that relativity is wrong. It simply developed on it. So there are a lot of inconsistencies, incompatibilities, but that's just how science really works. It is self-correcting. So we can only hope well, clo uh, as close as po possible to reality, even if it's not reality itself. That is the stance of scientific anti-realism. We are not so bold as to say that all oh, science is absolutely true. Yeah. That. Is it choppy? Hello? Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, my next question would be directed to Sir Badong. Uh, you, Hello, sir. Hello, I'm here, yes. Yeah. You you mentioned before, uh, earlier, yung tungkol sa yung definition mo or criteria, what is scientific. So, you mentioned it, it must be testable, uh, experimented upon. Or, yung, tama ba yung ano? Yung, yung pagkaintindi ko? Yes, I actually um, I gave you the first the um, original definition of science from the Latin word scientia, mm -hmm. and then we now have different um, definitions of science. We have I have here a state of knowing, knowledge as distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding, yeah. um, uh, and now I also defined it earlier as um, a science can also be defined as um, how we understand the natural world using our yeah. um, different senses. Yeah. But now they arbitrarily define the word as naturalism and so it sort of precludes the supernatural in, in explaining. But yes. are you familiar with, uh, with philosophy of science concept about demarcation, uh, particularly uh, with the criteria uh, set about by Karl Popper, young falsifiability. So most scientists, I, I guess, if not all, uh, almost all of them uh, are now agree that the main criteria for science, for it to be called science, is for it to be falsifiable. I mean, uh, it has something. There's much hello, disconnected. Uh, mm, not on my end. Okay, padito. Uh, disconnected, si sir Badang. Uh, I will call again. Uh, disconnected, si sir Badang. Uh, I will call again. It has to make bold predictions that put itself at a risk. That if its prediction is wrong, then Possibly we can we can uh, treat the theory as falsified. Although, siempre this falsificationism principle is not set in stone. So, dahil nga ano eh, it looks at science as very sterile, as very objective. Science is still a human endeavor, eh. so we are all entitled to our biases. So, there are many other philosophers of science. Aside from Karl Popper, yan nga dadating sila Thomas Kuhn, sila Imre Lakatos, pero those are more advanced uh, readings already. Okay, thank you, Sir Don, for the explanation. Uh, parang offline na ata, ewan ko anong yari kay Sir Eric, but uh, uh, connection or power problem. Anyway, uh, Tess, meron ka pa bang concerns or questions? Mm, actually, as yes, of now, wala na muna siguro. Uh, anyway, siguro, since wala naman ta para magiging unfair tayo kung si Sir John lang pa. Oo nga eh. Um, anyway. Maybe what we could do is, since we're gonna upload din naman a recording of this broadcast, maybe there would be other questions once na-upload na to eh, yung archive. So, maybe, uh, Sir Don, baka okay lang siya mag-answer. I-direct namin sa yung questions if ever there will arise after may mag-post oh, sure, questions. Oh, sure. Sige, you could always just... Tatag ka na lang namin. Ah. And also, yeah. fully, uh, we could also, marami kasi tayo ngayon glitches ngayong araw na to, ewan ko kung bakit. Uh, siguro ulan masipin, kasi, uh -oh. lakas ng ulan kanin. Mm -hmm. Siguro kung makapag-organize din tayo ng live dito, yung parang, yung ginawa namin sa UNC last February. So, oh yeah, maganda rin yun eh. Do that. 
Anyway po, uh, announcement na lang po, uh, by next week siguro makapag-start na rin ng program si Rick. Kaso wala na si Rick sa online ngayon. Uh, bedtime na. <laughs> bedtime. So, meron po kami introduce na new program by next week. O, abangan na lang po ninyo ang announcement namin. Again, marami salamat po sa mga nakinig at sa aming resource speakers. Uh, although marami tayong glitches and uh, marami salamat po sa inyong insights at sa inyong mga na-share na kalaman sa amin. Uh, and then we... Again, ako pala may announcement. Yeah. <laughs> Sige. Sorry, singit lang ako. Um, invite ko lang those who would be listening um, sa Patas Meetup uh, this coming September 26. It will be at the Conspiracy Bar in Visayas Avenue. Everyone is welcome. Hindi siya limited to members of Patas. So, it's open to public. Um, you can just go there around 3 p.m. until maybe 7 or 8 p.m. Actually, pwede pa tayo mag-stay doon until late hours kasi um, there, there would be an artist performing sa Conspiracy Bar mismo. So, we could just finish the meetup and then we'll have the post meetup meet up there. Okay. So, yun lang. Siguro, September 26. We would end the program with Patas uh, Mokotang. Sigur- siguro, Tess, ikaw na lang. Okay. <laughs> Pero na, ikaw na lang. <laughs> ikaw naman, host. Ikaw memorize. Eh. <laughs> Man, it's just uh, yung uh, we live with uh, our patas uh, uh, ano to? Yung team. This is uh, think without fear, live without delusions. So, uh, I hope to see you next week for our next broadcast. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Salamat. Thank you, everyone. Uh, is Sir Eric uh, nina nakabalik? Oo, uh, naka-offline na siya baka siguro sa internet connection. Anyway, anyway, we'll just tag him sa Facebook siguro if there are any other questions. Yeah. Okay. The problematic nga rin recording. With that note, wow, we are signing off. Thank you for listening. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Don. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.